Andrew Womack Ministries presents part one in the Christian First Aid Kit, a six-part album. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. Father, we do love you and we just honor you. Thank you so much, Father, for what you've done to save us. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for the tremendous price that you paid so that we could have forgiveness of sins and freedom and liberty. And Father, we just dedicate this time that your Holy Spirit would move on our hearts and open up our hearts and show us things that will help us to receive all that you've already provided and to let it flow through us to other people. That, Father, not only we could be free, but that we could help set other people free, that we could make a difference. Father, we just pray that this time will be used by you to change our lives. And, Father, we thank you. We believe that you desire that more than we desire it. So we open up and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, let's turn over to uh, John chapter 14, and I'm going to share with you a teaching that I've entitled the Christian Survival Kit. And actually, I taught this um, 30-something years ago. This is something that God really spoke to me, and I actually have 16 teachings that go through John 14, 15, and 16. And of course, I, in these five services, I'm not going to have time to go through 16 teachings. So instead of this being the survival kit, maybe this will just be your first aid kit. Amen. <laughs> but it's going to be a potent first aid kit. kit. And I guarantee you, it's going to make a difference. Let me just quickly say that the, the way I came to this teaching was that there was a man who had cancer. And uh, I had led him into the baptism of the Holy Spirit a year before he was 65 years old. And um, he got so thrilled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it changed his life. He fell in love with God like he never had before, and this man was just thrilled. But then he got cancer, and honestly, he wasn't too concerned about whether he got healed or not. He was so excited about getting to go be with the Lord that he didn't care whether he got healed or not. So anyway, this guy got pretty bad, and he was in New Mexico, and got so bad they admitted him to the hospital and they said he couldn't live through the night and he lived for seven nights and he was actually getting a little stronger and so they let him rent an ambulance and go back home to Colorado Springs and his wife called me just to let me know what the situation was and said that you know they said he probably couldn't live 24 hours and I said well let me talk to him and he couldn't hold the phone so she had to hold the phone up to him and I said, Les, don't you dare die until I get there. I said, you stay awake. And uh, we rushed over to his house, a friend of mine, and, and uh, we ministered to him. And he got so excited and fired up. And we started going over every day, for e either every day or every other day, for about two or three months. And this man got to where he couldn't even hold a phone up to his ear to where he was up walking, he was eating, he was driving a car. And he was still battling cancer, but I mean, he was getting stronger every day. And um, it's a long story, but as I'd go over, I'd just share these things, little nuggets that I'd learned over the years about how to build yourself up and how to speak to the mountain and how to release the power of God. And I mean, it was making a visible effect in this man's life every single time. And his wife told me one day, she says, you need to take all of these things and put it into like a survival kit for Christians. When you hit a crisis situation, just like when you have uh, the devil on your back and just about to destroy you, some place that you could go and just pull all of these teachings together into one place. And I got to thinking, man, that's great. I wonder how I could ever teach that from the word instead of just teaching it out of um, like life experience or something. And as I was reading, I came to John 14, 15, and 16, and it just dawned on me. This was Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he had said in the 13th chapter, he knew everything that was going to happen to him. He prophesied that Peter was going to deny him, that all of the disciples would deny him. He had made it clear that he understood the crucifixion was coming. And the disciples were about to enter into a period of time in between the crucifixion and the resurrection where it looked like everything they had believed was for nothing. 
They didn't understand the resurrection. That was evident by their reaction. And this was going to be a crisis situation. You talk about that you have crisis. Just imagine what it would be like to be one of Jesus' disciples and he was arrested and beaten and crucified and dead. And not only are your hopes that he was the Savior dashed, it looked like he had been defeated. The confusion, the hurt and the pain just over that would have been unbearable. But then you'd think about that if they got him, how long is it going to be before they come to get me? And they had given up everything. They even left their families, their wives, their children. And for three and a half years had hinged everything on the fact that Jesus was going to be the Messiah and that he was going to do these things. And it looked like it had been to no avail. They felt shame. They probably felt confusion. They felt like helpless. Where are we going to go? Where, what do we do from here? They had given up everything. Peter even said, Lord, where can we go? You're the ones with the words of eternal life. They didn't have a plan B or plan C. They were committed. I could just go on and on, but you talk about crisis. I believe that if you are facing anything today, what you are facing is nothing compared to what they were facing. Plus, you factor into this the fact that the more God is going to use you, the greater God's plans for you, the greater Satan's attack against you. I was talking to one person tonight, and he said, you wouldn't believe the things that have happened to my daughter during the last six years. It's just, it's unbelievable. And I said, well, one of two things. Either she's opened a huge door to the devil, or she's some powerful woman, amen, and the devil's trying to destroy her. I said, it's either that she just has dropped her guard, her shield of faith, and the devil has overrun her, or it could be a compliment. You know what? It's not always the fact that you've just done something wrong, but I mean... The, if you are at the front of an attack, you are the one that they're going to get. I remember when I was in Vietnam, you know, I, I had trouble saluting in the army. I don't know why. I just didn't like it. And I got, I had all kinds of things happen. I was threatened to be court-martialed because I didn't salute some guy one time. And so anyway, I got paranoid about it. Man, when I'd see somebody coming, I'd salute them quick. And when I got to Vietnam, I was on a fire support base. It's 120 people on top of a mountain, 45 miles from the nearest U.S. installation. It was like an outpost. And I saw a bald-headed colonel come walking across the hill. And when I saw him, man, I was quick to salute. And this guy grabbed me and threw me on the ground. And was on top of me. And he says, if you ever see this bald head coming again, you better run the other way. If you salute me, I'll kill you. And I thought, which is it? Amen. <laughs> what's the deal? But, you know, I, I, I asked him, I said, well, what's wrong? And he says, out here on the front lines, we've got the Vietnamese watching us. And if you salute me, they know I'm the superior and they'll kill me and not you. He says... Don't you ever salute somebody out here on the field because you know what? The enemy goes after the leaders, after the commanders. And it's the same thing in the body of Christ. If you are a leader, you just got a huge target on your back. And these guys were the ones that Jesus hinged his entire ministry on. Everything was dependent upon them. Everything. And I guarantee you, Satan was trying with everything he had to destroy them. You may say the devil's after me. Man, I, I believe that very few of us have ever encountered the devil personally. We deal with demons, but you know what? Even sometimes, I don't believe it's the devil. I believe sometimes the devil takes notes on the way you mess up your life. I believe there's sometimes the devil says, oh man, that's a good one, amen. I need to remember this. I wouldn't have ever thought of doing this. We blame a lot on the devil, but a lot of it is ourself, or if it is demonic, it is a demon. But you know what? Satan himself, I doubt seriously that most of us have encountered Satan himself. But at the Last Supper, it says Satan entered into Judas. Judas was present at the Last Supper. That was in the 13th chapter. That very night, within hours of this, Satan himself was present where these people were. And I can guarantee you he had every 
principality and power, all of the leaders of the demonic realm there. And every demon was focused on these 12 guys to destroy them. So I say all of this to say that when you talk about, man, you just don't know what I'm going through. The disciples, I believe, were challenged and in a crisis situation in, mo in a way that most of us can't even imagine. I say that because people like to think, man, my situation is worse than anybody. Nobody knows the trouble I feel. Nobody knows my sorrow. And we like to make ours worse. I have people come all of the time saying, oh, but you know, my situation is so bad. Or people will tell me, you don't know what it's like because you've never done this and never done that. You know, Jesus never was married and yet he gave instructions on marriage. You don't have to learn everything through hard knocks. You know, if you want a good financial advisor, I'd go to one that hasn't been bankrupt a hundred times. Amen. I'd go to the successful one instead of the one that's been through everything. There's no doubt that if you failed and if you've had problems, God can use that and turn it into a testimony. But I'm just saying that there's people that love to say, you just don't know what I'm going through. And yet the Bible makes it very clear that there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. First Corinthians 10, 13. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Anytime you go to thinking that your situation is unique and nobody can understand you, Satan has already defeated you. You're already in unbelief. You're already in crossways to the word of God and you've set yourself up for failure. I'm trying to say all of this to let you recognize that what we're going to talk about tonight is something that applies to you. And if you haven't ever been through a crisis, hold on, you will, <laughs> amen. I believe most of us have been through a crisis, but if you haven't, you will. We live in a fallen world, Satan is gonna fight you and you're gonna need to know what to do in a crisis situation. And Jesus, this was his last opportunity to talk to his disciples before his crucifixion. It was his last opportunity. Just by virtue of that fact alone, I believe it shows that Jesus he used his last moments with his disciples to give them something very important. In John 14, 15, and 16, he spoke words to his disciples trying to prepare them. I'm, I'm going to start in John 14, 1, but look at 16, 1 first. And in the middle of this discourse, he says, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. In Mark chapter 4, the scripture teaches about the sower sowing the word. And it says that the devil comes with afflictions and persecutions. The disciples were about to go through some afflictions. They were about to go through some hardship. And it says that, he, that the devil does that. And then people get offended and the word doesn't work. You lose the power that's in the word because of an offense. And Jesus said, I have spoken these things, the things listed in John 14, 15, and 16, to keep people from being offended, or you could say, so that the word would still work. I really believe that if the disciples would have followed the instructions of Jesus right here, they didn't. But had they followed these instructions, the disciples did not have to be in fear and in, in grief and mourning during this time in between the crucifixion and the resurrection. There are 14 separate times Jesus prophesied his death. There was about eight or nine that he prophesied his resurrection and made it clear that it would be on the third day. He gave them all the information that they needed. And did you know that the chief priest remembered it? The unbelievers remembered it. They went to Pilate and they said, this deceiver said that on the third day he'll rise again and would give us some soldiers to guard the tomb. The unbelievers remembered the prophecies, but his own people forgot it. And they were just sitting there huddled in fear and grieving over all of the things. And yet Jesus told them these things. And he says, I'm saying this so you won't be offended. Brothers and sisters, you do not have to fall apart like a $2 suitcase when crisis comes. The Lord gives us everything that we need to be able to prosper. And you know, I get flat for saying this. I don't understand that to me. I'm trying to encourage you that God's got victory for you and he wants you to do something good and be blessed. And yet I have people mad at me all of the time because saying you aren't empathizing and sympathizing with those that are hurting. I have compassion for you. I have enough compassion to say, get over it. Amen. 
and get on with it and draw on the power of God. But people want you to get down in the mud with them and get stuck and get dirty and get hurt and, and bitter with them. I was telling a man last night, he was crying. He saw somebody was hurting. I said, you know what? You need to have compassion. But if you empathize and if you get into the same hurt and the same pain that that person feels, then you are useless. You got to have compassion for people, but you can't get there and feel the same hurt and the pain or you'll get the same results that they've got. Man, that's powerful truth right there. And so Jesus told his disciples these things so that they would not be offended, so that they could have walked in victory. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you can't keep a problem from coming. We live in a fallen world. If you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. <laughs> if you start going upstream, you're going to encounter some resistance. An old dead fish could float downstream, and that's what a lot of people are doing. They're just letting life run down. But if you start doing something, Satan is going to fight you. You're going to have problems. You cannot keep a problem from coming, but you can keep that problem from getting on the inside of you. You can't keep a storm from coming, but you can keep the storm from getting on the inside of you. Pastor Bob Nichols and his church went through a tornado that destroyed their old building in 40 something seconds gone. I don't believe there's any criticism of them because it came. But you know what? They didn't let that storm get on the inside of them. Man, I saw him on the Internet two hours after the tornado destroyed everything. And he says, we're going to be twice as good as before. Amen. And they are twice as good as before, if not more. They went through a storm, but they went through it. You are going to have some problems. But man, Jesus said some things right here that are awesome. And if you will take this, it will enable you to go through anything and come out without the smell of smoke on you. Amen. The Hebrew children weren't wrong for being thrown in the furnace, but they believed God and they came out without any smell of smoke on them. We've got so many Christians that are limping through life. And I have compassion for you. I'm not mad at you. But I'm saying God doesn't want you to spend the rest of your life limping and burdened and hurt. Man, there is victory. There is complete restoration in Jesus. You do not have to spend the rest of your life grieving over something that has happened. I remember when Calvary went to what wasn't uh, what Will Rogers the very first Sunday. They went there and the newspaper showed up because they wanted to see this church. It was just devastating. And the, and the reporter says it was like they won the lottery. Man, they were shouting and praising God and everybody was so happy that it was like, what's wrong with these people? They're delusional. But you know what? They knew these truths. And because of it, they came through twice as good or more than they were before. All of this facility, their Christian facility over there is all paid for. It's a miracle. Amen. They're blessed. And they take the very thing that the devil meant to destroy them and work it together for good and use it to glorify God. You can do that. I don't care if you've been through a divorce, if you've been through terrible things, if your life has had tragedy... God can turn it around and work it for good, but you've got a part to play in it. And look at what Jesus said, talking to his disciples in the midst of this crisis situation. The very first thing he says is, let not your heart be troubled. Did you know that most people think now that is unreasonable? You can't tell people that. As long as it's a hangnail, yes, you're supposed to praise God, even if your little finger hurts. As long as it's something minor, yeah, praise God because, you know, God's bigger than a hangnail. But let it be something big and you'll have Christians come up and say, you're in denial. You aren't facing facts. And they'll sit there and, and they'll, you, you aren't working through the grieving process. And they, I tell you, there's a lot of psychology that has gotten into the church. There's very little of the church that's gotten into psychology, but a lot of psychology has gotten into the church. And there are people that are embracing their hurt and pain, 
Now, I'm not saying that you deny it. I'm not saying that you put your head in the sand and act like nothing's happened. I'm not talking about denial, but I am talking about denying hurt and pain to dominate you. Jesus told his disciples in the midst of this crisis situation that was worse than any of our crisis situation, don't let your heart be troubled. And if you were to diagram this sentence the way that we learned to do in school where you have to have a subject and then a verb and an object and all this, you would be the understood subject of this sentence. In other words, you don't let your heart be troubled. And yet the average person today would say, but I can't help it. This person did this. You don't understand. The doctor said this. You don't understand. I lost my home. I lost my job. And we have things uh, that we use as excuses to say that I can't help it. I'm only human. You aren't only human. One third of you is wall to wall Holy Ghost. One third of you has the power of God on the inside and you do not have to respond like a mere human being. Am I denying the fact that I'm human and that I've got emotions? No, but I am denying that that's all that there is to me. There's a part of me that is able to handle anything that I can overcome in every single situation. Jesus would be unjust to tell them facing the, you know, here they were, they were going to see Jesus crucified. And he's saying, don't be troubled. Most people would think, well, that's wrong. You should be troubled. Most people think something would be wrong with you if your heart just wasn't totally broken. Jesus said, don't be troubled. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. Most people think that it, it is right when something tragic happens to just be devastated. And they embrace this devastation and they run its course until they're just about to be destroyed. And finally they realize, I've got to get help. And then they turn to the Lord and ask God to help them. But Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. I personally believe your immediate reaction when a crisis happens really dictates whether or not you're going to overcome most people let their emotions and their hurt and their pain just run its course and wait until it is this huge stronghold in their life. And then they start turning to God and ask God to overcome it. It is much easier not to let that storm on the inside of you than it is to get it out of you once it's already come. Your immediate reaction to crisis is going to set the tone for what happens. Man, I'm thinking of Debbie... More over here, Alan had that massive stroke and immediate, I think it was the Christian survival kit that they had been studying. And this is one of the things that the Lord brought back to her mind is don't let your heart be troubled. And Debbie stood stronger than horseradish and believed God <laughs> for Alan. And I mean, he should have been dead and he's not dead. And Debbie just stood and stood. And I believe that the fact that she would not let the fear and the hurt and the pain and the unbelief and the tragedy and the grief come in is one of the reasons that Alan is with us today and alive and well. Praise God. Your first reaction is critical. You know, I've had horses most of my life and they never were real nice horses. They were green broke horses is what they call it. In other words, you could ride them, but you needed to know what you were doing. Amen. It was like a rodeo every time you got on. <laughs> and I had uh, some people want to come out and ride my horses. And a little seven-year-old boy came out. And I took the word. James chapter 3 about, you know, you put a bit in a horse's mouth and turn him about, whichever. And I told him, I said, a horse can't do anything without his head. If you have a horse on the ground, you could take a Clydesdale horse that weighs 2,000 pounds, put your foot on his head, and a horse can't get up if he doesn't throw his head first. And so all you got to do is hold his head down, and you can hold a 2,000-pound horse on the ground. A horse can't get down on the ground. It could trip and fall, but I mean as far as to get down and roll, it can't get down without, first of all, putting its head down. So if you have a horse that wants to roll, you just got to pay attention. And if it starts to put its head down, you jerk that head up. And I guarantee you, it will not get down and roll on you. If you have a horse that tends to rear up on you, you put a tie down on it. And that horse, if it can't throw its head back, it can't rear up. A horse cannot go that direction with its head. Turn this direction. So if a horse starts to run away from you, you grab one. That's not the best way, but I mean, last resort, 
you grab one rein and pull his head to the side and that horse will go in a circle and stop. <laughs> so I taught this little seven-year-old boy that and he rode my wild horses for two hours and it was okay. And as he was leaving, a guy came out, 23 years old, and he had just gotten married and he was trying to impress his wife. And I started to give him some of the same instruction. Oh, I can handle it. I know what to do. <laughs> so I said, okay. I mean, in less than three minutes, the guy was on the ground and on his way to the hospital. And you know why? Because he let the horse get a full head of steam and then he was just going to stop it. And I tell you what, once you let a horse run away with you, it'd be better to jump off. <laughs> you very seldom are going to let a horse with a full head of steam bring it back under control. And the reason I bring that up is to say it's like your emotions. If you let your emotions get out of control and then you're going to rein them in and now you're going to start believing God... You're just whistling Dixie. It's not going to work. It's, this is the reason. The very first thing out of all of the things that Jesus could have said, the very first thing, don't let your heart be troubled. It's a good word. And most people think that is unreasonable. I can't do that. Jesus would have been unjust to tell you to do something that you can't do. The very fact that he told you to do it means that you have the capacity, the power to do it, or God wouldn't have ever told you not to do it. You can control your emotions. Contrary to popular opinion, even popular opinion in the body of Christ, you are not the evolved, weak, just natural human person that we are claimed to be. We were created in the image of God and the person on the inside of you, especially believers, as we are created in his image, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And you can control your emotions and you can control your feelings. You can control whether or not you have depression, whether you are encouraged or discouraged. First John, first Samuel chapter 30, David encouraged himself in the Lord. His God, when all of his guys wanted to kill him and stone him, David encouraged himself and he called for the ephod, which is the Old Testament equivalent of the Bible. He called for the word and he inquired of God and he built himself up and he encouraged himself. If he hadn't have encouraged himself, he'd have either committed suicide because the situation was so bad or his guys would have killed him. But within 48 hours, he, all of his vision came to pass and he became king because he encouraged himself and didn't give in to the depression and the discouragement. Brothers and sisters, you can do it. The very fact that Jesus told you to do it and gave you a command. This is not a suggestion. He says, let not your heart be troubled. He didn't say try and keep your heart from being troubled. Work on it the best you can. You won't be able to win at it, but do it as much as you can. No, it's a command. Let not your heart be troubled. And in the very end of this Deal. John 16, 33, the last thing he said unto him in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Some people think, well, we are supposed to be of good cheer and we're supposed to not let our heart be troubled as long as nothing bad happens. But if something bad happens, you, you can't do anything about it. Jesus said in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He acknowledged that there's problems, but that doesn't affect how we are. You can rejoice in God regardless of what's going on. Amen. That's good. Thank you for both of those amens. And that one, that's good. Amen. You know, we're in church and some of you are putting on your most holy, righteous reaction. But if the truth is, in reality, most of us feel absolutely justified in griping and complaining and talking about our, how bad our situation is. And I'm saying it in love, but I'm telling you the truth because the truth will set you free. But that's the very reason that you're staying in the bondage is because you feel justified. You feel that this is the way it's supposed to be. Most of us, it's like you build a little fence around you and say anything within this perimeter that comes against me, I'm going to overcome it. But if it's outside of this, if it's death, you gotta, you gotta grieve, you gotta be destroyed, heartbroken, hurt. If it's a divorce, if it's, you know, whatever, if it's financial collapse, if you lose your job, you, you got every right to be depressed and discouraged. 
Jesus didn't put any qualifications on this. Again, he was talking to his disciples in a situation that was worse than the situation you're in. And he says, don't let your heart be troubled. You know, I've told this story many times, but it's one of my favorite. If you hadn't heard it, you need to hear it. And I like it, so I'll tell it again. <laughs> but I go to Charlotte, North Carolina every year. I've done it for 20-something years. And I went, and uh, the, the, um, one of my partners calls his staff in. they got about 30 employees. And he says, the clock is running. I'm paying you. You sit and listen to this man as long as he wants to talk. And I just preach the gospel to them. It's not a Christian business. And there's a lot of unbelievers there. And one year, I did that and went back and there was about, I don't know, 10 or 15 of his employees that got born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Great things happened. And one woman came and she was crying and she says, I'm not a Christian like you and Chip, the owner of this business, but I know that prayer works. And she says, I want you to pray for me. And she told me she was an alcoholic. Her husband was an alcoholic. They were dirt poor. They were struggling. And this was either, I think it was her fourth marriage. And her husband had just told her he was going to divorce her. And she was so distraught over this. She says, I can't go through another divorce. And she was just crying. And she says, I tried to kill myself yesterday. And she had slept, slit her wrist and had gone into the hospital. This was her first day back at work. And she says, that's the reason I tried to commit suicide. And she was just crying. And she says, would you please pray for my marriage? I can't go through another marriage. I can't lose another marriage. And so anyway, I just stopped this woman. I said, now let me make sure I heard this right. I said, you aren't a Christian. And you know you aren't a Christian. And she said, that's right. And I said, if you were to die right now, you would go to hell and not to heaven. And she said, yes. And I said, and you want me to pray for your marriage and not pray for your salvation? And she looked at me and she said, yes. And I said, lady, don't you realize that after you've burned in hell for a thousand years, you won't give a rip whether that marriage worked or not. I said, who cares about your marriage? You need to get saved. <laughs> and it's just like I slapped this woman. She just sobered up. She quit crying. And she says, you know, I think you're right. I need to be saved. And so I prayed with her and this woman got born again. And uh, then we prayed for a marriage. I'm not saying that God didn't care about her marriage, but I'm saying what's important. But see, some people would say, but if you're going through a divorce, something's wrong with you if you just aren't totally shattered. I mean, that's justification for you being on medication and having to take sleeping aids to go to sleep and do everything else. I mean, it's just, that's all understandable. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Could you rejoice going through a divorce? Certainly. If nothing else, you ought to look at it this way and think, thank you, Jesus, that in heaven they don't marry nor are given in marriage. Amen. This is temporary. I'm not going to have to deal with this for all eternity. And you ought to be praising God for eternity. Or you can take the scriptures that the Lord will never divorce you. He's engraving you on the palms of his hand. And you ought to be saying, thank you, Jesus, that even though I'm a jerk, you would never divorce me. That you still love me. And you could praise God for that. You could find something to praise God for. You could let not your heart be troubled even if you're going through the midst of a divorce. You can find something to praise God for regardless of what's going on. Pastor Bob Nichols right here has blessed me so much because I've heard him preach on, thank God it's as good as it is. <laughs> Man. Man, Bob's been through his church being destroyed. Bob and Joy's daughter is, have been in a bad situation for, what, 12 years or more. And 24-hour nursing care, and yet Bob just praises God. One time I was holding a minister's conference and I was talking about glorifying God from Romans 1, 21. That's in that series on the discover the keys to staying full of God. And I was talking about just praising God and being thankful. And this is right in the midst of Bob was having trouble in his church. He had had trouble in his uh, family with his daughter having these problems and just all of these things going on. And I was talking about being thankful and just praising God. And I mean, Pastor Bob... 
I never will forget this. He just threw his Bible on the floor. He stood up and threw his Bible on the floor and he said, I've taken all of this I can take. And he says, thank you, Jesus, that things are as good as they are. And he started praising God. And I mean, revival broke out among these ministers because people knew that they were hurting and knew that they had problems. And here's a man that was having more problems than them, just glorifying God. And it inspired other people that they can do it. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you sold yourself short. You believe that you're only human. You aren't only human. You got the spirit of God on the inside of you. And God wants you to let not your heart be troubled. It's up to you whether your heart gets troubled. People are going to God and saying, oh God, my heart's troubled. Please solve my... He told you not to let your heart be troubled. You encourage yourself in the Lord. You do something. Most Christians are coming to the Lord. Oh God, I'm powerless. God, I can't do anything. Would you please do this? And God says, I gave you all power in heaven and earth. I told you to stand up. I'm not talking about just doing it in human strength. But I'm saying when you stand and do what you can do, then God supernaturally energizes it. But you've got to take a step. Peter couldn't walk on the water by himself, but he got out of that boat by himself. He took the first step and then the moment he stepped out, the supernatural power of God enabled him to do it. But you know what? He could have just sat in that boat praying, oh God, help me to walk on the water. But he had to get out of the boat. You got to get out of the boat before you can walk on the water. Everybody wants to walk on the water. They want the miracles, but they're afraid to leave the boat. You got to get out of the boat. You got to do something. You need to recognize that God told you not to let your heart be troubled. Well, how could I do that? The last part of that verse says, you believe in God, believe also in me. You know the simple answer? Faith. If you would believe God, you know what? You could let not your heart be troubled. You don't have to be worried about things. You can cast this over on the Lord. You can get into faith and start believing God. Let me turn this around and say it this way. That you know what? If your heart is troubled, I'm saying this in love. This is supernatural God compassion. It's because you're in unbelief. That's the truth. Oh no, you don't know what's happened. Again, Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled with no exceptions. And if your heart is troubled, I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset at you. I love you enough to tell you the truth that it's because you aren't believing God. It's because you aren't looking at things from God's perspective. You know, if nothing else, if nothing else, the worst the devil could do is kill you. Some people are like, well, isn't that bad? <laughs> it's really not bad. We're all going to die anyway. And you get to go to be with the Lord. That's the worst thing that could happen. I mean, we sing these songs, when we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be. And then the doctor says, you're going there and you start crying. <laughs> Something's wrong with this picture. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'd rather, I'd rather die and go to be with the Lord, but I'm going to stay here for your sake. How do you intimidate a guy like that? Say, we're going to kill you if you don't quit preaching the gospel. You just reach up and kiss you. Oh, this is awesome, man. Today's my day. Say, all right, we'll put you in prison. And so he says, all right. And they just start praising God at midnight. Glorifying God. God goes to tap in his foot and an earthquake comes and sets them all free. And they don't leave. Because they weren't praising God just to get something. Here, this is a radical thought. They were praising God because they were actually excited about God. Amen. And when the earthquake set them free, they didn't run. They just kept praising God and saw the jailer and all of the prisoners uh, born again and set free. And so they say, well, man, we're going to turn you loose. And he says, fine. So you know what? If you're already dead to yourself and if you really were trusting God and had this attitude that Paul had, if the doctor tells you you're going to die, it'd be all you could do to keep from kissing the guy. 
And if he says, well, you're going to live, you're healed. Great. I'll testify and glorify God and tell about how good God is. Man, you just can't lose for winning. If you think properly, really, Satan can't do anything to us. The worst he could do is kill us. That's no big deal. And some of you think you're crazy. <laughs> you're weird. I think you're weird. <laughs> this is the attitude that the Bible says we're supposed to have. We're supposed to not count our life that big of a deal. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's faith. And if you don't have that attitude, that's the reason your heart is troubled. You know, I just got back from China and we saw people over there that have been beaten for their faith, cattle prods, tortured, beaten, beaten. One man was in prison for 10 years and they did unspeakable things to him. And he got out and since he's been out in the last 20 years, they started 200,000 churches. Probably over 10 million people in his churches. Doesn't have much money. Doesn't have much of anything. Nobody will ever know about him. I can't tell you his name because the government's looking for him. Would love to have him. He'll never be famous. He'll never be rich by American standards. And yet he's happy and he's glorifying God because he's found out that there's something more important than all of these things. Some of you are upset because you haven't got your fifth flat screen TV yet. This guy probably doesn't even have a flat screen TV and wouldn't care if he did have one. There's something more important than that. And he doesn't get upset because he hasn't got this and he doesn't drive that. And I'm not saying God doesn't want you to have things, but I'm saying our priorities are so misplaced. We are so focused on this natural world. And if everything doesn't go exactly right and you didn't get the promotion that you wanted. These people are just thrilled that they aren't in, in prison being tortured. And they're thankful for that. And yet we get upset because somebody else got the promotion. Because somebody else got the recognition. Because this happened or that happened. or Man, just get over it. Pull your thumb out of your mouth. Grow up. Realize, you know, if we would put our eyes on the Lord and get to a place like some of these people, man, you just realize that this stuff's not that important. It's not that big of a deal. If this person doesn't like you and criticizes you for being a Christian, we go to crying and go to, oh, God, this person has criticized me at church. I mean, at work, they're giving me a hard time. Man, go over and meet the people that have been beaten. That have been martyred. The people that are printing my books in China. They have to. The guy that gets it done. Has to go through two different people. And pass notes and do all of this stuff to hide it. He doesn't even know who it is. Because if they catch this guy that's printing the books. They kill him immediately. You know what? That's persecution. But having somebody look at you and roll their eyes. Because you <laughs> believe in healing. You know just get over it. Get into faith and realize, man, that it, praise God. I tell you, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the mercy, because if I was God, I'd just turn you into a pile of ashes. The first time you went to griping about, oh God, my finger hurts. And because of it, you're thinking about renouncing your faith in the Lord. And you aren't going to go to church because you got, and you know, I just... Drop kick you right off the earth, amen. <laughs> Have you floating in outer space and say, how do you feel now, amen? <laughs> Man, praise God, I'm not God. <laughs> Man, God is a merciful God, but you know what? We ought to get over it. And this is what the Lord is saying is get over it. Don't let your hearts be troubled. He had told them 14 times, I'm going to come back and be resurrected. If they had really believed the word of God, they could have been rejoicing during this terrible time. They could have been thinking, man, how is this going to work? I saw him crucified. I helped bury him. How is this? They could have been excited. They could have actually been in faith instead of in fear. You know, you could actually get to a place to where through a rough time, you say, I know it's going to work out. The worst thing that's going to happen, I'm going to go to be with Jesus, but I believe God's going to deliver me from this. And you could actually get into faith. You know, when my son died, I was called and told at 4.15 in the morning that my son was dead. And like anybody, I started to have feelings of grief and sorrow and things that anybody would. 
But on the way in, I just don't believe that I have to have that. And I was basing it primarily on this verse and this teaching that I've done. Let not your heart be troubled. And I said, I am not going to be troubled. I am not going to operate in grief. I am not going to be in sorrow. I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to be depressed. And many of you think, but if your son died, you can't help it. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. And I decided I am not going to let my heart be troubled. And on the way into town, I just started praising God because I felt like crying and I didn't want to. And so I started operating out of who I am in Christ. And I started praising God and talking about how awesome God was. And I told him, God, you did not kill my son. I'm not mad at you. You're a good God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. And I just started worshiping him. And you know what? When the, when the word came, when we got this phone call, you know the very first words that came out of my mouth is what I heard Pastor Bob Nichols say. The first report's not the last report. And that's what I said. The very first words out of my mouth. He had just said this at a minister's conference. And I said, the first report's not the last report. Don't let anybody touch him till we get there. And on the way in, I just went to thanking God and praising God. And God reminded me of prophecy. And he encouraged me. And pretty soon I, I got into faith. And I got to rejoicing and laughing, telling Jamie, this is going to be the greatest thing we've ever seen. And when we got to the... Uh, into Colorado Springs, my oldest son met me and he said, Dad, I don't know what happened, but five or ten minutes after I called you, Peter just sat up and started talking. He was in a morgue. He was on a slab in a cooler, stripped naked with a tote tag on it, been dead for five hours and sat up and started talking. No brain damage. No more than he had before. <laughs> Praise God. It was awesome. And you know, I am absolutely convinced that one of the important things that worked there was the fact that I just said, I am not going to let my heart be troubled. If I had given in to it, I guarantee you, I don't think I would have had the results that we had. I'm not trying to condemn anybody by saying that. But I am telling you that the Bible says, don't let your heart be troubled. How do you do it? Believe God. Believe God. Man, that's powerful. And I can guarantee you there's people right here in this auditorium that you've got crisis because we live in a fallen world. There's bad things that happen to every single person. You can't necessarily keep bad things from happening, but you know what? You can let not your heart be troubled. You can stand up. You can operate in faith. You can put it into its perspective. And you can believe God. And if you believe God, you are going to come through on the other side. You know, another story about Pastor Bob, I hate to just keep using him, but I do this when he's not around. I use these stories all the time when I preach on this. But I remember when he moved into the First Baptist Church, I forget the exact details, but they, they only had a, between 100 and 200 people in the post office. And when they moved into First Baptist, it was a huge 2,000 seat auditorium. The payments were out of this, out of sight. He was trying to refinance it. He had a balloon payment stuff. I told him, I said, you know what? If I'd have been one of those, I think there was like less than 200. And when they moved in, half of them left because <laughs> they thought you're crazy. So he even had less people. And I told him, I said, if I'd have been one, I might have thought you were crazy. I mean, this was huge, huge step of faith for a hundred and something people to take over a what was it? Two, three hundred thousand square foot facilities. Huge facility. And anyway, because of that, he had financial problems for a number of years. And he talked about one time they were facing a, a balloon payment and it was crisis. And he went out and laid in a field because he had to have a word from God. And laid there all night long waiting on God to speak to him and crying and waiting on God. And nothing happened. And so it was beginning to get light. People were beginning to drive by. People could see him laying in the field. <laughs> and he finally decided he'd get up. And anyway, he got in his car and turned his car on. And he heard a voice saying, Preacher, you don't have any problem. All you need is faith in God. <laughs> and it was R.W. Shambach on the radio. But he didn't recognize it. He just turned his key off and thought, was that God? And then, 
And then he realized that it was the radio and Shambot, but you know what? The damage had been done. He got the message. He'd been praying all night long. Oh God, speak to me. And the Lord said, you don't have any problem. All you need is faith in God. And you know what? It worked out and he came through it. And this facility is paid off and debt free and it worked. Praise God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we've got the power of God on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is there to comfort you in all of your tribulation so that you can comfort all others with the same comfort that you've been comforted with. First, second Corinthians chapter one, the Holy Spirit is there. It says that when this is the rest. This is the refreshing wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, even speaking in tongues. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you to quicken you. And all you have to do, speaking in tongues is like flipping a switch that automatically just starts this engine, this dynamo running that releases power. And we've got spirit-filled Christians that have this ability on the inside that are just sitting there whining and talking about, oh God, please help and not using what God has given us. I tell you, if you will encourage yourself, if you will do what you can do, then God will take that little step of faith and he will supernaturally energize it. But you have to let not your heart be troubled. You have to believe God. There's some people here tonight that you need to take that first step of faith. And instead of nursing your pain and nursing your hurt and nursing your fear, and nursing all of these negative things and feeling totally justified and going to people and wanting everybody to pity you and wanting a little hug, which again, all of us need hugs. I'm not saying that that's, that's totally wrong, but I'm saying many of us are codependent upon the natural and we're looking for only natural human results and we're trying to deal with our crisis in a totally carnal way. I'm telling you, you need to take a step of faith. Some of you need to stand up and just declare in the name of Jesus, I am not going to let my heart be troubled. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to come through this thing. I believe God is going to heal me. And even if I don't get healed, I'm going to die and go to heaven. Praise God. And you're going to rejoice all the way. You believe God is going to supply your need. But if you never saw your need supplied, you've still got streets of gold and a mansion prepared for you. And you'll die and go into excellent, excellent prosperity, total prosperity. So you can rejoice even if you're in the midst of poverty. Even if people have rejected you, if you're going through a divorce, man, the worst thing's going to happen is they'll leave you. But God will never leave you nor forsake you. And you could praise God over that. There is nothing going on in your life that there isn't something you could praise God for. Praise God, things are as good as they are. Man, it could be worse. It could be worse. That's one of the things you see when you go to places like China and see people just struggling and hardship and things that you take for granted. It makes you come back and say, thank you, Jesus, that things are as good as they are. All of us have heard the story about the guy that complained about how much his feet hurt until he meant the man that didn't have any feet. And you go to thanking God, man, that my feet hurt, Amen. that I've got feet to hurt. Man, you need to be praising God. We need to take control. And I'm telling you that this is only done. This is counter human. It's counter carnal, counter just being natural. It takes somebody who believes that there is a supernatural God who has given us his power and that if you take that first step of faith that God's going to meet you, it takes faith to do this. And that's why the Lord put those two things in the first verse. The very first thing, don't let your heart be troubled, believe. You believe in God, believe also in me. Make a decision that praise God, I am not going to gripe and complain. I am not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not even going to be troubled. I'm going to believe God. And you stir yourself up. If you don't stir yourself up, you're going to sink to the bottom. You got to stir yourself up, amen. And you got to do something. And speaking in tongues is a powerful way of doing that. I couldn't tell you how many times I fought off depression and fear and pain and, 
and different things by just speaking in tongues. And I sit there with my finger on 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it, it, or 4, that if you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. That means to promote spiritual growth. And I'll just stand there and speak in tongues with my finger on that verse until I get edified, because it says you edify yourself. And so I'll do it until I get edified, until I get built up. Amen. People are like, you aren't very compassionate. I am compassionate. I just don't pity you when God has given you everything it takes to be an overcomer. And we're going around acting like we're a beggar. And God, please do something. I have people come to me all the time and say, I, I can't do anything. The doctor says, I'm gonna, it's just hopeless. I, I can't do anything. Would you please pray for me? Would you agree with me? I say, I'm not going to get into agreement with you. You're in total unbelief. You don't believe you have any power. You don't believe that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. How am I going to agree with that? Man, you'll die if I agree with you. You can't agree with something like that. Man, you need to start from a position of victory and use some faith. And fight from that higher ground instead of getting down there in the valley and just talking about how bad everything is. Again, I am not preaching denial. I don't deny that the devil exists. I don't deny that my body hurts. I don't deny that there are times that I don't feel like praising God. But I just deny that I am only human. And that I have to be dominated and controlled by negative things. And I deny the fact that I have to submit to defeat and discouragement. I believe that this is the victory that causes us to overcome even our faith. It always causes us to triumph. Brothers and sisters, we can't do it. And, I, and this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. I believe what he did was take all of the principles he had taught them over three and a half years. And just in a little tiny like a bullet form, capsule form, he just went through and started mentioning some of the major things that applied specifically to their situation. And again, I think that it's a sequence here. The order is super important. The very first thing is grab hold of your emotions. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't get down there and wallow in defeat and embrace it. And then after you've already embraced it and confessed that you're going to die, that you're going to fail... Don't then start trying to serve God. Man, start from a position of victory. Don't get out of faith. Stand there, fight this off and say, I will not have it. Operate in faith, encourage yourself. And again, there's, there's three more chapters. There's a lot of things to say. But I think that this is critical. You know, I started teaching on this like 25, 30 years ago. And out of that came a series that I've got entitled Harnessing Your Emotions, all based on... John 14, 1. I've got five teachings on that one subject. This is a major thing in my life. And I can tell you, I think it's, it's one of the things that is rare today to find people that are consistent and just consistently praise God. Oh, that's good. I admire that. I admire Pastor Bob and Joy that it doesn't matter. I've seen them when people in their church died and they were at the conference and they were good friends. And they, they wanted to be here, but they were at the conference speaking. And you know what? I've seen them go through the loss of that. I've seen them go through the death of their parents. I've seen them go through their daughter being hurt. I've seen them go through problems in the church, financial. I've seen them have the church destroyed. I've seen them in good and bad. I've seen them in every, I've been in the hospital with them. I was there when the doctor says that the tracheotomy worked, but Pastor Bob... You, need, you know your daughter is brain dead. You need to just pull the plug and let her go. He didn't jump on him. He wasn't mean, but he just countered it and spoke his faith. And here she is 12, 14 years later, still alive and thriving and getting better. I've seen him go through things and I've seen them be consistent. They, I guarantee you, Pastor Bob is going to praise God. If a tornado strikes, he'll be out there in a hard hat saying we're going to be twice as good as before. You can do it. This is not unobtainable. Jesus told us to do it. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you got more capacity than what most of us are living up to. Most of us are tuned in, plugged into the world, and we've adopted their mindset. We've become weak and inferior, thinking that all we are is an evolved animal. I'm telling you, you were created in the image of God. 
God made you to be stronger and to be able to do things. And some of you need to pick yourself up. And maybe, it's, maybe you've already fallen apart like a $2 suitcase. It's too late to tell you not to let your heart be troubled. But you know what? At least now you can get up and start drawing on the power of God and start the process of getting over it. And you can get strong for the next thing that comes. And I'm telling you, you have the ability to overcome. The Lord is with us. He told Gideon, the Lord is with you, you yes. mighty man of yes. valor, as he was hiding from the yes. Midianites. <laughs> man, it didn't look like God was with him. And even Gideon said that. And yet the Lord said, you can do it. He had to prove the Lord five different times, putting fleeces out and doing things. But finally, he believed God. And he trusted God and they overcame, had a great victory. You can do it. I don't care what your situation is. It is not impossible. God is bigger than whatever your problem is, but you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to stir yourself up. You're going to have to step up and let not your heart be troubled. Take control. Act like an adult. Grab hold of your emotions. Rebuke fear. Rebuke depression. Rebuke discouragement. Rebuke all of these negative things. Stand up and start believing God and start confessing something and standing and doing the Word of God. You can do it. You can do it. And I know that there's some people sitting right here in this auditorium who are fighting with me in your mind and saying, that isn't fair. You don't understand. I've, I've said everything I've known to say tonight to try and win you over and yet... You know what? I, I just can't force you to do this. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm not upset at you, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. Amen. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is the truth. You can not let your heart be troubled. You can believe in God and you can start a miracle working in your life tonight. First Chronicles 16, 9 the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. Maybe it's 2 Chronicles 16, 9. But it says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong in behalf of those that are perfect in his sight. God's here tonight. I believe that God laid this on my heart. God's here tonight looking. Is there anybody here that would just grab hold of themselves and not let their heart be troubled, take a step of faith and begin to start believing God? Is there anybody here who would do that? The eyes of the Lord are here looking. And you know what? If, if somebody would just say, God, that's me. Don't look any further. Here I am. If you would do that, man, the eyes of the Lord are here. He would pass over everybody in this auditorium. He'd pass over all of the millions of people in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. He'd pass over everybody in America to find one person in here who was just willing to stand up and start operating in faith and believing God and trusting God. You would just be like a magnet that would draw the power of God once you start taking that step of faith. And yet the approach that most Christians have is to come as a total defeated person and just cry and complain and, oh God, would you please do something instead of taking what he's already done and using that power and encouraging yourself in the Lord. I'm telling you, it's a lot better. You start a supernatural process uh, going when you start taking a step of faith and believing God. You can do it. Amen. 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 Is there anybody here that would like to say, praise God, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to not let my heart be troubled. I'm getting over this in the name of the Lord. God is bigger than my problem. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just glorify you. We speak that you are bigger than whatever it is that the devil has fought us with. And we are not going to let our heart be troubled. Father, we believe in victory. We believe in power. We believe that you heal. We believe that you deliver. We believe in financial prosperity. We thank you that you can restore relationships. Thank you that you can heal us of shame and of failure and of the problems that we've got. We believe that everything is possible with you. Nothing is impossible unto you. And Father, we just right now refuse to give up, to give in. We refuse to let our heart be troubled. We are going to believe you. And Father, we believe for miraculous things to take place. I believe that a seed has been planted here tonight. 
that is going to grow. I believe people are going to go out of here encouraged and that Father miracles are going to start happening. People will be delivered. People are going to be set free by the power of God. Holy Spirit, we take this step of faith and we say that we can't do it on our own. We need your supernatural power. But we are looking for supernatural results, not natural results. We aren't believing it's going to take us 10, 20 years to get over our failures. We believe for a deliverance. We thank you for supernatural interventions. Thank you that you can comfort us and you can change us so that we don't limp through life. But that we can be whole and happy and that, Father, the best is yet to come. Thank you, Jesus. We just take a step of faith and, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to quicken us. And make us come alive to take this little step of faith that we've done and supernaturally empower it so that miracles happen. So that bodies are healed. So that finances are restored. Father, we believe that you are flowing right now. I believe that God is touching people now that people are being set free. You know, if you came here looking for a miracle right now, just proclaim it. Yes. Just say, I am not going to give up. I am not discouraged. I am not troubled. Start speaking forth that you believe that the power of God is healing you and setting you free. That your finances are changed. Just go to speaking forth your faith right now. The Bible says, declare the decree. Speak forth what you want. And put it into the past tense. I am healed. I was healed. I am healed. I am set free. Father, I do have what you said I could have. It is working in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. I believe that you are touching hundreds and hundreds of people. Those watching by the internet, Father, I thank you that you are setting people free. Right now that miracles are happening in their lives. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we agree. We receive it. We thank you, Father. Praise you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Act like the word of God is true. Believe that God has done a miracle in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We hope your heart has been quickened by hearing the word of God through this message. It's the faithful support of people like you who make this ministry possible. We invite you to prayerfully consider becoming a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries. 